Hey everyone! Hola a todos! This is Jahaira. And this is Stephanie. And welcome to Cuento Crimen Podcast. Y aquí on the Cuento Crimen Podcast, we are a true crime podcast and we bring a new case every Wednesday. Cada miércoles. And these are cases that don't get much media attention, so chances are you haven't heard of some of these cases. And we cover these cases in Spanglish. Así que agarra tu abuelita, tu abuelito, tu mamá, tu papá, a quien tú gustes, and come join us every Wednesday for a new true crime case. López nació el 8 de octubre del año 1948 en Tolima, Colombia, y es conocido como el monstruo de los Andes. And I know we've covered so many horrific crimes on this podcast, as we were saying in the intro, but the number of his crimes is really sickening. And like, yeah. you know, we, as we were saying in the intro, it's like, it makes your stomach turn. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. Like, even me like i can listen to any type of like true crime case and this one was definitely on the list of like mm -hmm. dark and just nasty mm -hmm. cases yeah but as per usual we like to include some background um he was described as a polite little boy y también de niño él quería ser maestro he had a really big family he had a lot of brothers and sisters i think he was the seventh child out of 13 oh wow that is a really big family pero él tuvo una infancia difícil, una infancia llena de dolor, tortura, hambre, abuso y soledad. And it was just really sad to learn about it. And, you know, to start off, his father had died six months before Pedro was even born. Entonces Pedro no tuvo papá. Like, he never met his biological father. Su mamá se llamaba Benilda López de Castaneda. And Pedro, as a child, witnessed so much for a kid, right? We read que he witnessed a lot of acts of prostitution. Y entonces, él de grande, él ya decía que, you know, all that he experienced, um, you know, it did have a bad effect on him. Mm -hmm. And he, he did know what was going on when those acts were happening. So it did affect him. And that's what he was saying as an older person. And see, I feel like that's one of the mistakes that a lot of people make. Like, piensan que nomás porque son niños, like, they're not processing and they're not, like, mm -hmm. internalizing what's going on. And, like, as someone who works with children, they are smart. They are completely aware of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not, like, consciously internalizing everything, mm -hmm. but it is all going in. Yes, and then, like, they grow up, put two and two together, mm -hmm. and, like, Oh, that was happening. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And that's why childhood trauma is a thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, it wouldn't be here. But anyways, besides her occupation, la mamá de Pedro was not kind to her children at all. She was very tough, all about the tough love. And it was just very rare for Pedro to feel, you know, that loving motherly side of her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in his childhood, things took a turn. So, en el año 1957, su mamá de Pedro lo encontró abusing his little sister. And this was when Pedro was only eight years old. Entonces, su mamá lo corrió de la casa and told him that he did not want to see him ever again. And, I mean, she was upset. Like, he was abusing a smaller yeah. sibling of his. And it's like, that's a very, como se dice like tough thing to see as a mother but then also you have to think about like he's only eight years old like gave us a niño de ocho años afuera like she threw pedro with no money no help i'm not justifying what he did mm -hmm. i'm not but i'm kind of just saying like maybe as a mother you kind of want to also help that child yeah you find know? help yeah you know, um see if there's any programs i don't know yeah or even like as an eight-year-old why Or how does an eight-year-old know all of... Mm -hmm. how, you know, you know yeah. I, mean? like, I don't know. It, it's a tough situation because it's like, as a mom, you're going to be mad. But I don't know. It's like, it's, it's not black and white. Yeah. You know, there's like gray areas. Like, you need to figure it out. And us, like, we don't even know. We're not professionals. Like, mm -hmm. um, so I, you have to go look for the professionals yeah. to guide you because it's complicated. Entonces, después de esto, Pedro estaba en las calles y luego un señor se le acercó y le ofreció ayuda. Y Pedro aceptó la ayuda y se fue con él. Y ese señor realmente no lo ayudó, like, no lo llevó a su casa de Pedro, no lo llevó a buscar ayuda, nada de eso. Él lo llevó a un edificio abandonado y allí el señor abusó de Pedro y allí lo tuvo por un tiempo. Do that is so, like, 
Sad, that's horrible. Mm -hmm. Y no estamos seguras de cómo fue que Pedro salió de allí. Solo sabemos that he finally made it out eventually. And this thing that had just happened to him, which is something very traumatic and something very dark and full of pain and hurt, you know, this completely changed him and his hate towards the world began. Uh -huh. Él dice que allí empezó su desconfianza de la gente y él tenía miedo. Y él dice durante el, el tiempo que él estaba en la calle, él se escondía durante el día y ya en la noche él salía a buscar comida. And soon after this, he made his way to Bogota, the capital of Colombia. Y a los 12 años, una familia americana viviendo allí en Colombia lo adoptó. They kind of just took him in. And this was just porque lo vieron en la calle pidiendo comida. And so, you know, if you see like a child all alone asking for help, I think it was only a matter of time until someone with a good heart reached out, you know? Entonces, now he had a place to stay, a roof and food, which is great. And they finally enrolled him in a school for orphans. Pero en el año 1963, he ran away. And this was two years after because he had been molested by a male teacher there. And so once again, Pedro is now back on the streets. He couldn't find a job and he did try looking, but he had no experience. And, you know, he was young. I mean, you know, something to think about. So no place was really trying to hire him. So then he turned to stealing. A la edad de 18 años, él se mantenía porque él robaba carros y vendía las partes de los carros, right? Mm -hmm. And this was what he was known for, and he was, like, good at it. And other people who stole looked up to him because, again, he was good at stealing and selling, cashing out for money mm -hmm. from the car parts that he sold. And so eventually he was arrested for stealing cars. He was 21 years old at this time, and he was sentenced to seven years. And while he was serving his time, apenas llevaba dos días en la prisión, when he was brutally gang raped by four men. And while he was in there, he made the choice to hunt down the four men that raped him. And I feel like this is just like, it's it's crazy to think about like how many of these type of experience he has encountered and mm -hmm. he's only 21 and like imagínate like this is all he really has known from life yes and like from in like pretty much infancy mm -hmm. his life has been pretty tough um you know he made this choice and he had a knife in the prison and he hunted them down one by one cuando salió de la cárcel, se fue a Perú y empezó a matar a niñas. Pedro López dice que by 1978, he had killed over a hundred girls before being caught and captured by members of an indigenous tribe in northern Perú. And he was caught trying to kidnap a girl. But the thing is, like the community members, ellos ya estaban preparados para, you know, capturar a esta persona who was stealing girls in, you know, the area. They were prepared to kill him. Lo querían matar. They, and they did beat him up with, they even buried him alive with only his head sticking out and they put miel on him so that ants can essentially like take care of the rest. Damn. So again, really brutal and like a lot of details. Yeah. And obviously like, you know, he has gone through a lot, you know, Pedro, but you know, the number is pretty high. He's killed girls. over a hundred girls and... That's a lot. Over a hundred girls. Over a hundred girls. Yeah, that's crazy. It is a lot. I feel like when shouldn't have even happened. Imagine a hundred. Yeah. Pero una missionary de los Estados Unidos habló con la gente del tribe because this person was friends with them. And so she was ultimately trying to convince them to let go of Pedro and, you know, turn him into the police instead of letting him have this like very brutal and very like raw death. Entonces, the tribe decidió aceptar, you know, that suggestion. And so the missionary supposedly, so this is a version of the story, right? So some people say that the missionary ended up taking Pedro to the police, but along the way, she felt bad for him. Y entonces lo que hizo fue que lo llevó a la frontera de Colombia, and then she just kind of let him go. Again, that's just one of the versions that people say happened. Yeah, and I don't know, like, You can't help but feel bad of like little eight year old Pedro, right? Who got kicked out of his house and he endured so much pain because yeah. of that. But also, like, he did commit so many crimes. How do you, how did this missionary feel bad for the person that was in front of them? Yeah. 
that they knew that this person killed over 100 little girls. Maybe this missionary didn't know about Pedro's infancy. So, like, how did she feel bad? Yeah. I mean, because 100 girls, it's a, it's a lot of girls that he murdered. You yeah. know, entonces, I mean, I can ponernos a pensar en la familia de esas niñas, en la vida de esas niñas, you know? I don't, I don't understand how you could feel bad for someone who showed no remorse and was willing to kill over and over again. But there is another version of this story, and that is that she did take him, but that the Peru authorities did not open up a case because it was costly. And so they just kind of let him go instead, and they actually deported him back to Colombia instead of, like, being the ones responsible to go through all of, you know, everything that Pedro did, basically. Y después de esto, que ya se fue para Colombia, desde allí él siguió... Caminó a Ecuador y durante ese tiempo él ya luego confesó que él mataba a tres niñas por semana. He strangled and raped them and then engaged in sexual activities with the corpse. He would hang out with them until he got bored and then he would go hunt for more. And for some reason, Pedro had an obsession with the eyes. Like there was a certain look of innocence and daylight because he liked looking at their eyes and watching their life being taken away. And it's just uh, like, me da escalofrío de pensar. Like this yes. is really what's going through someone's head. I don't know how he could hang out with like corpse. Yeah. Until you get bored of them. Yeah. Like, I don't that. know. It's so much detail. In I've this always case. been like very intrigued by like because this is not the first time right that you hear about something like this like a serial killer que le gusta you know just kind of hang out with like the dead bodies and stuff and i always wonder like why like what is going on yeah like the process the psychology yeah the psychology side of it exactly why does that happen and so yeah um he would continue on hunting little girls and he would follow them for days and then just wait to strike at the perfect time to take them away. Authorities did see an increase in cases, pero ellos pensaron que era all because of the South American like sex trafficking thing. And, you know, that was also like a, like there's a big increase in like human trafficking. And so they kind of just related it to that. Like they never thought que it was a certain someone that was causing all of these crimes. In el año 1980, there was a flood in la ciudad Ambato in Ecuador, and four bodies appeared because of this flood. Y cuando examinaron los cuerpos, supieron que alguien les hizo daño, y, you know, they were buried, and this was a crime, like an intentional crime. Mm-hmm. And soon after, from this discovery, Pedro was arrested when he tried to kidnap a girl. And esta niña estaba con su mamá y él intentó to snatch her and he started running away but the surrounding people stopped him and told him hasta que llegó la policía por él y él fue detenido en el marzo del 1980. I'm glad that people like stepped in yes. and tried to stop because the number of videos que yo he visto donde alguien ha tratado de llevarse a un niño y todos los que están alrededor like kind of just freeze and freeze. get stuck and I mean I get it like it's like like holy crap this is happening you know yeah. but I'm just glad que some people can like snap react. out of like you yeah. know the, the, the whole like freezing state you know mm-hmm. and it's like what fight or flight type of yeah. thing so this is nice reading that people right. acted and they saved that little girl ultimately mm-hmm. Entonces, cuando lo detuvieron, él no estaba cooperando y él no quería decir nada, no quería contestar las preguntas, no quería hablar con nadie. Mm-hmm. Y entonces, con los cuatro cuerpos que aparecieron y lo que había pasado with him, like, trying to kidnap this girl, mm-hmm. they were trying to see if there was a connection between these two situations. Authorities had a lot of questions. Y nada estaba conectando, pero querían hacer una investigación Uh, pero él no estaba hablando. Like, he was not cooperating with them whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It's probably because he knew. Yeah. <laughs> so the investigators had to come up with a plan. And so they called in a priest and, I guess, in hopes for Pedro to confess to the priest. And the priest came in and gained Pedro's trust. Y él empezó a hablar con él. Pedro confesó 
todo lo que había hecho to the priest and it got to the point where the priest could not handle it and he actually asked to be removed from his presence like that's how horrifying the details were yeah and like the numbers mm -hmm. porque, i mean yeah he confessed to so many murders like más de 100 it's a lot y las autoridades no le creían al principio ellos creían que eran unos números demasiado alto y por eso es que no le creían. I mean, who gets away with a hundred murders? Can you believe that? But along the way, se me hizo muy interesante lo que Pedro hizo because Pedro noticed que las autoridades no le estaban creyendo. Entonces, él les ofreció llevarlos a los cuerpos to see if maybe, you know, that way they would take him seriously. Mm -hmm. And so he did just that. He took them to the bodies. He took them to a site that uh, when they searched it, they got 53 bodies of little girls between the ages 8 and 12. Yeah, makes me like, mm -hmm. ugh, you know? And like one site. Yeah, yeah in one site. Pedro los llevó a 28 other sites, but no other bodies were found. And so ultimately, Pedro was charged with 57 counts, but with boost to 110 counts because of his confession. En el año 1981, Pedro was charged to a full sentence of 16 years. He completed two years in Ambato, and the remaining, he was transferred to a penal called García Moreno. In 1994, he completed 14 years in prison and was released two years early on good behavior. I don't know how good behavior balances out everything that he did. Yeah, I don't know either, but he was released... Right. Mm -hmm. On August 31st, 1994, as an immigrant and handed over to Colombian authorities who later charged him with a 20 year old murder. When he was taken in, he was declared insane and held in a psychiatric wing of a Bogota hospital in the year 1995. In 1998, he was declared sane and released on a bail on certain conditions like more treatment and things like that. But he ran away. And before he was released, he told his therapist that he would kill again because he had this unexplainable feeling that he got when he would kill. And I think that just means that he was not okay. Not okay. And he was definitely like a serial killer like this is why they kill yeah right because they get off on the feeling i don't understand how he was declared sane if he's saying these yeah. things you know and in 1998 he was released but he disappeared after visiting his mom so i believe there is a warrant for him over a fresh murder that happened in 2002 not too sure about that um some sources say that he was last seen in 2010 when he visited his mom and after that he no one knows anything about him that makes it like really scary in the year 2012 which honestly like ya hablando de 2012 it doesn't feel like it was that far off we mm -hmm. were teenagers almost about to graduate high school yeah But in 2012, another murder in Colombia happened and it had a lot of similar circumstances as the killings that he had done in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, no one knows if it was him. No one knows where he is. But a lot of people do believe that mm -hmm. he he had murdered again. So Pedro Alonso Lopez, he murdered a minimum of 110 young girls from the years 1969 to 1980. But he does claim that he murdered over 350 victims across Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. Pedro was a person who referred to these girls as his muñecas, as his amiguitas, and it's sick. That that comment right there makes my stomach. Amiguitas. Yes. Like, ugh, can you, oh, I, know. I can't, I don't want to think about it too much. It oh, just like, makes even just, my stomach hurt. Even just like thinking about how those were probably some of the last words that the little girls heard. yeah. We have a quote from him, and él dice, and I quote, I like girls in Ecuador. They are more gentle and trusting, more innocent, end quote. Y él también dice que he committed these crimes because he lost his innocence at the age of eight, so he would do the same to all these little girls. That's just, I don't know. It's... Just it's, because you went through something doesn't mean you have to cause that same pain to other people. Yeah. You know, it's And like... I'm also thinking about, like, how much pain he felt 
at the age of eight to make his whole brain like rewired and want to kill and all that, you know? And do that to potentially 350 girls. That is insane. We do not mean to scare you all, but as of now, he's kind of nowhere to be seen. He could be alive. No one really knows. But as of October 2022, which was last year, he would be 74 years old. So, hay una posibilidad que él todavía esté vivo. Yes, pero ya más viejito. Más viejito. This is a very gruesome case. And I don't know, I think it does open the conversation up. Like, obviously, this person shouldn't be on the streets. It should no. have been stopped. Yeah. Right? Help should have been there for him. Yeah. As a little eight-year-old, right? In order for him not to have done all this. Mm-hmm. He, this guy right here, Pedro Alonso Lopez, he is low key the boogeyman. Like, he is low key what little girls are going to be scared of, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, who knows if he is in Colombia or in Ecuador or in that area? He might be somewhere completely new. He might be even here in California. And I think that's the scary part. Like, no sabes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it definitely is. I think it, you know, especially, well, now he's older, right? Mm-hmm. But when. You know, he was on the run and even slightly younger. That's still scary. Yeah, it is. Because, like, who knows if he did commit more crimes. And honestly, like, I mean, by his statements, it's likely that he did commit more yeah, crimes. Yeah, he showed no remorse. And he's literally saying, I like the feeling of killing. Mm-hmm. So what can you expect? Pero pues como dice mamá, hierba mala nunca muere. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Hopefully, though, he hasn't murdered anyone else. He- yeah, so, it's yeah, we understand this is a gruesome case. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a lot to hear. So, hope that y'all unwind from, you know, this true crime case. If it is gruesome for y'all, go treat yourself to something to get your day going and mm-hmm. not be stuck on this case for so long. If y'all are interested, of course, like, do more research and, like, if you read about him and whatnot, but... Come yeah. talk to us over on Instagram. Yeah, let us know what you think because this one is a lot to like talk about and yeah. unravel, you know, all that. Um, so yeah, we hope that y'all like this episode and thank you for listening and we'll see y'all next week.